started. It is a long title for this talk, Whose Game Is It Anyway is the Question, How Community Relationships Shape Games, Five Years of Warframe. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Ford, I do, <laughs> I do live, stop, stop. stop. <laughs> I, I paid them all to do that. Um, I'm, yeah, so no, I do live ops and community at Digital Extremes. Uh, I've been there for about seven years and I've worked exclusively on Warframe in that time. So there's two things on this that you might need to know a bit more about to understand the context of this talk, and that is who are Digital Extremes and what is Warframe. So geographically, Digital Extremes, London, Ontario, Canada, my beautiful, I know we have a multimedia guy here on our team who probably hates this slide, but that's an arrow pointing to us. Our closest US city is Detroit, so that could give you an idea of climate and or other things. Um, but the company has been around for 25 years actually this year. This is, uh, you know, 1993 founding, and and in 2012, things really changed for the company, and that is because of Warframe. So this is a marketing version of what the game is. In my words, it's free to play, it's co-op, it's a third person action looter shooter. And um, that's what's, you know, we've been doing it for five years, and I'm standing here today to tell you about that journey. And I'll do it kind of structured in the classic agenda style. This is sort of uh, what we're gonna what we're gonna get through today. We're gonna to talk about how we operate with Warframe as a free-to-play game that's been operating for five years. Uh, we're gonna, then we're gonna get to the hits and the misses. This is sort of, if you take as many swings at bat as we have with all our updates, some of them are hits and some are misses. And when I say misses, this isn't you know, disparaging work that we've done a bad job, it's just the way the community responded to it. And you know, we have an amazing group of developers and it's just sometimes things don't go the way we had hoped. And then if there are questions at the end, we can absolutely talk about those. So again, multimedia cringe, but uh, I tried to make my character look like the operation board game guy, but it didn't work. So anyway, um, we went from a 750 meg file to 30 gigs. That's a lot of growth. That's a lot of you know, game changes. And how did we do it? I bolded the, the only word that matters, which is consistency, but the rest is you know, good note taking. Uh, it's because we really do update consistently with Warframe. When you're a Warframe player on PC, every week you're getting something. If you're a Warframe player on console, likely every month you're getting something. And that consistency sort of makes its way in three areas. It's either a fix, a change, an addition, one of those, all of those, some combination of the two, or the three rather. And um, that's a... Uh, that's a routine that our players really expect. If it's a Wednesday on PC and we don't have a hotfix note out, the players start asking, where is it? What's happening this week? And we tell them, we say, okay, well, guess what? We are a bit late with this week's update, so expect it tomorrow. Or uh, you know, we tell them, oops, uh, it's actually gonna be Friday. Or sometimes we say, actually, we can't do anything this week. But the communication is, uh, is always consistent as well. And that's, with every relationship, I think it's the first part that is a takeaway is that the community understands our routine of what we're doing with Warframe, and when they come to you know come to the forums to see what update we have, they they know that we're going to have something for them to read, whether it is the update or where you know status of where that is. But that routine has um, it has visuals. It looks like this: a weekly update for five years tends to change the way the game looks. So in 2012, a player would have come to Warframe and seen what's on the left there. They saw some blue menus. They saw their character in the middle. And in 2018, if a player comes to Warframe, they see, you know, this is the same screen, it serves the same function, but they're seeing five years of growth and consistency. They're seeing a UI overhaul, they're seeing better lighting, they're seeing a physical uh, space for their character rather than sort of floating in space. And they see cloth physics, which is great. Um, but that's a great from a dev lens, you know, you can see really clearly the improvement that the game has gone through from the hard work of the team. But from the community lens, because that's what we're talking about today, it looks a little more like this. It's space Barbies now. We have, we have hot pink and we have purples and we have a very, very nice uh, stance going on here. And I know it's a bit of a joke to say space Barbies, but the relationship that this picture shows actually is quite in depth, and it starts with something silly like a bobblehead. Because you know, when Warframe added spaceships to the game, uh, players thought a good thing for a spaceship would be a bobblehead, so dev made it so. And players are quite talented, and the community can really foster some interesting artistic talent, so we started doing user-generated content, and you know, players had that idea, we were able to do it, so dev made it so. 
We have my, I think it's my right foot on my left thigh, looking quite graceful, because players wanted more in-depth customization. So they said, we should be able to mix and match animation stances. So Dev made it so. We, I'm holding a gun here that is only uh, accessible if you've played the game for a long time. It's a loyalty reward of sorts, a login reward system. Our original login system wasn't particularly rewarding, so the players wanted a new one, so Dev made it so, and now you can get weapons through it. And the last sort of thing that's hidden behind all my other arrows, I guess, is a beautiful, a beautiful cape. You know, what's a game without capes? But that was something that Dev actually wanted. They thought having cloth physics in Warframe being a little more robust would make it look better, and players agreed. So Dev wanted it. Players thought, hey, that's pretty cool. So again, Dev made it so. And that's really the simplified version of how our relationship works. The players can want something, and Dev makes it so. But of course, it's not that simple, because there's you know, sometimes thousands of players when we were starting, and now we have millions of players. So when millions of players want something, uh, and you only have about 200 devs to make it so, what, what, how can you solve that problem? So what we try to do is empower our community team uh, to try and make sense of all that, to prioritize, to learn how to say no or yes to either sides of this equation, the beginning or the end. And um, basically, with this structure, we've been able to have a lot of hits and misses with our community. We have tried a lot of different things in Warframe's lifetime. And uh, you know, it's been a long and wonderful five years, and we will start talking about what the hits and misses have been with the community relationships on these uh, deployments. And when I say deployments, I truly mean a lot of deployments and a lot of swings over time. This is some publicly available data from Steam. Um, it's our concurrency on Steam Spy. So uh, you can see that we started, and luckily we've grown and grown, and it's going up, and it's great. And of course, there's timestamps of years on this. So uh, we should talk about those years, and we should talk about what happened, what good and bad things happened with uh, the community relationship based on Warframe. So a bit more structure for you uh, as time is linear, I will start in 2012 and make my way uh, over the years leading up to today to really give you a hit, give you a miss, talk about what we did, and then recap it. But all Warframe stories should probably start at the beginning, so to 2012 we go. So once upon a time, uh, Digital Extremes, the company, uh, is mid layoffs, and Warframe really is a last ditch effort for the company to you know, not go under. So this year we were, <laughs> it's the, the hit of this year, was infrastructure, and this is something that isn't you know, reflected in the game, but it's reflected in the tools we built around the game to do it ourselves, because we had no publisher, we only had the sort of, I'll say, desperation to make it work. So what did that mean? We did a lot of research into things like Zendesk, having forums, having you know, a scalable backend, which is some some fun stuff to work with for a free-to-play game. How are people going to download the game client? How are they going to log in? How are they going to authenticate emails? So doing all that type of research, um, it was easy to. Ex it was a very accessible game in 2012, which was great if the game didn't have a miss, such as bad free-to-play design. So not that it was bad. It was just we were making a lot of mistakes and. Those mistakes uh, are scary when you're doing it yourself because to release a free-to-play game and have some of the first reactions to it be pay to win, that's very dangerous. And for us, uh, very early on, we really spent a lot of mis time making mistakes that we didn't know we were making because we had never done free-to-play before, which could be the case for some of you, could not be the case, but it's scary and it feels really bad to see that your community that was born two months ago is starting to say things about uh, the game that you might not have realized uh, was negative. And it's really easy to pinpoint, if you listen to the community, what, what, what the mistakes looked like. So another red arrow, a different styled one this time, um, is pointing at this gold icon, which our community calls potatoes, which in early 2012, Miss Warframe signified pay to win. It signified having access to power levels um, through real money. And that was bad. And uh, that's not a good way to start your free-to-play uh, journey. So what did we do? It's quite misleadingly simple, in fact. This year, we just listened and changed very quickly. So we're sitting at forums that, of course, we did not invent forums, using software for support that, of course, we did not invent. But we used it with the desperation of um, a company that was on its last legs to really do what we said we wanted to do, and that was to make fair free-to-play. And what we found was that um, relying on the community to decide what is and isn't fair was a really important part of early Warframe, and we knew 
from, you know, as we learned from the error of our ways, which had no malice behind them. We were just simply, we didn't know. Um, we knew that we wanted fair free to play to be a part of Warframe's DNA, which uh, leads us to the next year after 2012, which is 2013, which uh, is a year that uh, was really interesting for Warframe. We started doing some real-time communication with our communities that did change the relationship. And the first hit of this year isn't an in-game thing yet again. It's the way we talked about our game, which was with dev streams. So dev streams are something we started in 2013. We've been doing them for five years now, bi-weekly. This is a thumbnail from almost every stream we've done. Uh, get all the devs on there, sometimes the regular crew, sometimes not. Uh, and what we did was we just talked about the game. We talked about what's changing, and we used it as a scalable way to answer questions from our community. If you have 200 forum posts asking the same question, you can answer one and hope your answer spreads, or you can see that there's clearly a need for a, bit, a broader, more scalable communication, in which case, ta-da, we did dev streams. We do them on Twitch. It's one of the many tools we use for community uh, including, you know, you have your forums, you have Reddit, you have, of course, dev streams. The Wikia is good for us, as well as, you know, your, your web tools that you can sort of customize for blogs and uh, what it may be. But these have been great and, uh, you know, five years going with them. However, in the actual game sense, a hit this year for the community was clans. So this is an explicit social structure in Warframe. This is someone coming into Warframe, doing their miss missions, but then staying in Warframe because their clan mates are there. And they're staying in Warframe because they get to build this space treehouse dojo that is theirs and theirs alone. And that's really Great, great for the social and relationship experience between clans, but statistically, um, we've found that the sooner someone's in a clan, the actual, the longer they play Warframe, the more they engage with, so it's good for retention as well. And it's actually also really interesting from a relationship point of view, because clans have identities. You know, if you've been in a clan that's PvP focused, or perhaps, you know, customization focused, competitive, it gives people on the inside a way to access a member of that clan, perhaps the leader of it, and get really concise information about players with that goal set for the game. So they're really useful if you can get close with the clan members. Sometimes they don't want to get close to you, but it's totally fine. You just got to make it work. So um, yes, now the miss. This is always the fun part because <laughs> things go wrong. Uh, this is a fun comic from Penny Arcade. You know, you got your player their Warframe landing in, and he looks over at his co-op buddy, and he's all decked out in cosmetics because, of course, uh, in free-to-play, you'll often find cosmetics are a way to monetize, and we have done that um, with great success, but it's not always been a consistent success because early Warframe stats had cosmetics, and if you're buying something and it changes the way you play, that's also dangerous for free-to-play. So we stopped doing that in 2013. We said no more stats on cosmetics but the eternal war had only begun in that line of work because here I am in 2018 with a screenshot of my character with a helmet that has stats on it. So in 2013, we got rid of stats on cosmetics, but in 2018, I still have the item. So how can that be? How can these things coexist? And the answer is community relationships are complicated. So this is when your eyes may begin to lose focus because it's a lot of words on a slide, but it is a complicated history. And that's sort of the, the essence of change and community growth is that there usually is a history. So in 2012 and 2013, our nice looking helmets had stats on them that dev decided. But in 2013, we saw that the community didn't want that because they didn't want to have to spend money on things that changed the way they looked. So we said, okay, no more stats, but guess what? Anyone that had that item, you're grandfathered in because you can't take away a loyal player's investment. So then 2014 rolls around and those loyal players wanted to take off those stats. So we added a tool for them to do that. And then 2015 rolls around and you know what? What if we put stats back on cosmetics but players could choose their own stats? So we did that. And now it's 2018 and literally two weeks ago, cosmetics don't have stats anymore. So <laughs> um, if that's making your head explode, um, that's sort of the point. Uh, community relationships are complicated, and just a little slice of the work we do, even if something as simple as stats and cosmetics, it has history, and the history always, in our case, at least we try to respect the player investment up until that point. So a loyal player that liked the stats on cosmetics, they should get to keep them, even though we're changing the way the system works. Um, so yeah, it can, that's sort of 2013's miss that carries on to the eternal war to this day. 
But what did we do? Um, in the same way that Goku can take the energy of people and turn it into something useful on the community team, we sort of tried to do the same thing. Um, it's you really just need to focus on the consistency across the players' messages to you to make sure that what you're taking in and putting back out is useful. And you know, nothing's better than a spirit bomb sometimes. But um, right, recapping that real quick. Uh, in 2013, what we found was uh, for this relationship with our Warframe players. We had to grow our channels to communicate, and we had to use them to talk about change. We don't just sit on a dev stream and say, here's a new thing you can buy in two months. It's, hey, guess what? This change is coming again. And you know, you see Twitch chat explode with sometimes negativity, but that's OK, because you're there, and you're going to deal with it on the spot. Um, right, 2014 rolls around, as you would expect. And for the game this year, things went a little rapidly crazy with change. We're, we're on, um, we're on a, a, a year where we're changing combat, we're changing visuals, and we're actually adding story to our little looter shooter. So in you know 2014, we have our hit. I'm not going to play the sound on this, or will I, because I don't have a choice. OK, I'll talk over it. But this is Melee 2.0. So Melee 2.0 comes around. It allows a player to equip their melee weapon and do combos. They can block incoming fire. And they, uh, they get to equip that sword and that sword alone. Up until this point, players had only been able to quick melee, so their sh swords were sheathed and they could only pull them out quickly and maybe do a charge attack, but that was it. And we redid our melee system because the players wanted us to. They were growing a collection of melee weapons that they felt were too similar, and they thought it was about time that we re redid that system. So if you've been making a game for two years at this point and you hear it's time to redo systems, well, get, you better get started if you're us. So we. We didn't just redo it, we redid it sort of bi-weekly reports to our community. We showed our team, um, our community rather, through the dev streams, like here's a gray box of what I was working on two minutes ago, and this is what it's probably gonna look like, because it allowed us to, and the one on the, the other, oh, that's actually a really cool gift, but that one is um, a newer Melee thing that's coming, because we're still working on this. Even in 2014, introducing the system was one thing, but players still wanted more, so we continue to revisit it to this day. And that was a massive change for the game because we added so much more to the system that players were asking for in the effect of, I want to go out there by, with my own sword like a ninja instead of always having to have a gun with me. And we did it. And we showed them the progress. So a miss. Uh, the words grind frame sometimes come to mind for people with Warframe. And it's not, you know, I play all the time and this is, this is the world we live in, but it's easy for us to sometimes contribute to that narrative if we're not careful. And we're, we're never malicious about anything, but it's just really hard to balance resources in a free-to-play game. Because the way players engage freely with your game, they have to earn their gear and they get to go collect resources. And this particular resource, uh, you know, it looks quite innocuous at a glance, it's nice and crystally, but it's actually called Oxium. And it's something we added to the game uh, just to give players something else to go after to build the new content we were making. Because we're adding, and in order to have people start all from the same place to get that gear, everyone gets a new resource to go after to do it. And sometimes we miss the mark on balancing that and understanding um, that a player doesn't, maybe doesn't want to spend six hours doing the same thing over and over again, or maybe they're okay with it if the, the gameplay is a little different. But ultimately, Oxium represents sort of the beginning of the difficulties we've had with resource balancing. Uh, and what's really interesting statistically is when the community notices, uh, which, you know, they notice the moments that something like this happens, they keep track of it. Um, and there's often a, a point from the community where they'll say something like, you guys must be raking in the platinum because you're, you've made this so hard to get. And that's actually not true. Uh, a lot of the data uh, that we've looked into for this is if you look at something that has a you know, high grind cost, it doesn't actually sell any better than the things that are easier to make. It's, so we're not really benefiting from it at all. All it's doing is giving the community um, points of it's basically pain points to say this doesn't feel good and you shouldn't do this. So you always need to think about that before you release something. But if you're releasing an economy from scratch, you know you you, you do your best, but it doesn't always go right. So what did we do this year? Um, in many ways, we just took it all in. Uh, uh, the, the great things that were coming from Melee 2.0 were extremely positive feedback, engagement with the Melee system. Players were very satisfied with that. But at the same time, um, we were, we were taking in all the feedback about what Warframe, what players were saying Warframe was becoming, which was Grindframe, which has a negative connotation, but ultimately, um, 
the, the way of the game is to get your resources. So it's tricky, so you just take it in. And in 2014, we learned that change is one thing, overhauling is another, so don't just change, of course, you should overhaul. And when the community does start to weigh in on grind tolerance, take note. So on our team, we were taking note of how, what was the difference between someone saying, oh, I can't get this now, or the, the, more, the more voices added to that uh, particular line of feedback. All right, another year, here we go, it's 2015. This was a really interesting year for Warframe. Um, we added our first cinematic quest this year, as well as our first region-locked content, which simply put, we added a really good surprise this year and a really bad surprise. So the good surprise was the second dream. And I do have a little video on this because, of course, the word community relationships were heavily in my title, and having a good surprise for a player at this point who had been playing for three years, the way they reacted to us surprising them with content that told an emotional story, because up until this point, you know, you're going into different maps, you're shooting, you're getting your loot, your character's starting to feel really, really awesome, but there's no, there's no emotional weight to what you're doing uh, to the degree of what we unleashed this year with the second dream. So I'll quickly play this video, um, and it's just a collection, well, you'll see, I'll shut up. Wow. Oh, oh my god, that looks sick. What is going on? <laughs> oh my god. That is mind fuckingly amazing. Just incredible. Oh my god. What? Oh my god, that was so cool. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Wow, this is so cool. This was unbelievably amazing. Oh my god, I enjoyed that more than anything I've ever enjoyed in Warframe. <laughs> right, so if you are in a three-year relationship with your community and for the first time ever you get a reaction like that, it feels great. And the reason we were able to do it is because we surprised them. So on the one hand, you have these dev streams and you're showing the gray boxes of your melee animations. You're showing, you know, just crazy things happening in the game that they expect. And then to deliver the unexpected to that loyal player base yielded a reaction like that, which for the relationship with the community really expressed um, a turning point in not only did they want us not, they didn't just want the entertainment of Warframe Space Ninjas, they now wanted more story, and they wanted to relive this moment again. So we've been trying to do that year after year, it's not easy, but we'll get there. Uh, so that's a good surprise, but a bad surprise. Uh, this picture, again, quite innocuous without context, but this is Umbra. This is uh, when 2015 hit Warframe got a deal to launch in China. And to hype it up, we had added region exclusive content to that build. And the global player base saw it and said, when do we get that? And we didn't have an answer because we didn't know. So the, you know, everyone's Google translating the Chinese press release. I'm reading them saying, is this true? What's going on here? Because we were, we had a bad surprise in many ways. And we weren't prepared to communicate this information to our loyal players who wanted nothing more than to know when they were getting this, which by the way, they still haven't gotten. And even last year when we announced Warframe's open world on live television, the most used words in chat were Umbra because they had waited so long. And even though we just minorly teased Umbra last year, that's what the Twitch chat um, really grabbed onto. So you can see on the left-hand side. So that's a bad surprise. And um, you know, in high, like, there's always hindsight with community relationships. I wish we had communicated it differently. I wish we had known about it in advance. But that doesn't, you know, you can't, you can't, that'll never work. You can never go back and redo something in a community relationship. So we, what did we do? Well, we did two things. On the one hand, um, it was, you know, with the dawn of streaming and YouTubing, I'm sure everyone sees how big that's getting. Having the players broadcast themselves playing our content allowed us to capture the moments that really you know, so the surprise and delight of doing the, a Warframe quest for the first time. And on the other hand, uh, you know, we had to try and put out a lot of fires with Umbra that we actually continue to do to this day. And, you know, what, what can you do? Bad surprises linger, and, but there's a thirst for it now, which is kind of interesting to observe. But either way, 2015 was all about taking risks and really planning to surprise our loyal players with the good surprises, but not bad ones. But well, what can you do if a bad surprise comes out? Because usually you're caught in the crossfire as well. 
So on the heels of that inspiring reaction video about the second dream, 2016 rolls around and the way that um, the players reacted to the second dream was starting to sort of deteriorate the desperation DNA we were having as a company because we really felt like we were onto something. Because when your game you've been working on for three years starts to elicit a response like that, it really feels like, okay, we're, we're doing this now. Let's, 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 let's see what we can do with this. So of course, what best way to take a, a a successful moment than to not just turn around and look back and say, what did we leave behind along the way? So 2016's hit was a little bit of nostalgia. Up until this point, the game had continued to change, grow. I, I don't know exactly what our file size was in 2016, but you know point A was 750 and point B today is 30, so we're talking somewhere around 20 gigs probably, and that's a lot of change in additions. So we decided to redo our navigation system for about the fourth time this year because the players wanted us to. We had given them this in 2016 and a bit earlier, which was a console-friendly, we thought, a user-friendly way to navigate our game. You know what planet you're going to, you pick your mission tile. But it turns out uh, the players didn't like it and had been telling us for a long time. And not only that, it actually was worse for retention, uh, statistically. So with all great things, go back to some nostalgic roots and return the star chart to its node and line form, which was something the players had really wanted since we abandoned it for the tile system. And this brought, even though this was a bit of a bumpy launch, as, as it can happen, the players saw our commitment to the past Warframe vision and felt that even though we had changed the story in the year prior, the roots were still there, especially in um, the visuals access points to all things Warframe. Every planet and every mission was starting to look a little more uh, like it used to. And a miss this year, so you know, with every hit comes a miss. This is something that, um, again, it's a brief video, that it was the most fun I think a lot of people at DE had developing it, which has, you know, that Those doesn't, that doesn't mean the players will. So let's take a look. Who have refused the blood of the conclaves. I call to you to join us in honor-bound tradition. Team Aurora. Okay, so we were at PAX and we were coming off the heels of the second dream and we showed that video and we were all grinning because we're like, yes, players are gonna love this. And because we love, you know, you heard the chanting in the video, that's the devs in the theater, like having a great time. We were adding a sport to Warframe because Warframe's not a competitive game, it's cooperative. So surely the way to do competition is with a sport. And it was just silent, the reaction at PAX East. And it, it you know, we had to release it, of course. And we still, like even, I still love it. And I just know that even though we loved making it, it did not resonate with our player base at all. And you kind of had to acknowledge that. And you had to look at it and look at the way it released and say, okay, uh, I guess I guess we're not updating that content type anymore, even though we had a lot of fun making it, um, which was sort of like, what do we do, right? Well, in the same way that, but, <laughs> Like, we tried, and I, I, honestly, the team worked so hard on surprising our players with different things, and I, I, I wouldn't have not done it ever because it was just so fun. But the players understood that we were taking risks and trying, and they're not gonna be mad about your mom embarrassing you, you know, it's fine. And we also found that this year, 2016, we were really hitting our stride on our platform launches, so not, we're not just a PC game anymore, we're also on PlayStation 4 and Xbox. So things were starting to get a little uh, muddy about who's getting what information. So because we eat a lot of Domino's pizza, we thought we should do a pizza tracker for our builds. So we built, because um, you know, you get your pizza, George is making it and Tracy's bringing it to you. So on our website, we built a sort of that version for our platforms. So on PC, uh, there's really only two states in development and live, uh, but on consoles, you have development, cert, and live. And these always point to a human source of information. So one of our community members on that team makes a thread, says, hey everyone, guess what? The build's in the oven, and it's gonna have this, this, and this, and we'll let you know when it's in cert. And we use this, uh, we just made this little widget. It points to uh, you know different statuses and different links for you to always based on our forums, just to have these conversations with your players about where their builds are. And of course, if you have a complex multi-platform game with no build parity, you might want something like this, which is our case. 
So yeah, 2016, um, what we learned that year was never stop changing and overhauling. And as a group of devs who have, at this point, four years of lessons, the fun you have developing something might not resonate with your players, and maybe you should move on quickly from that, if that's the case. And uh, so we did, even though, you know, I don't think I've played Lunar in like a year, but I'm going to now, because I got nostalgic, which apparently was a lesson from 2015, so time, oh no, actually 2016, sorry. Anywho, uh, so 2017, this is last year, um, and this was a year for Warframe, when we talk a literal community relationship. We had one of the worst and best moments in the same year. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the miss this year, and then I'll talk about the hit. So whatever structure I gave the past years, just not anymore, um, the miss. So DE versus data mining. So for all these years now, uh, we had really turned a blind eye to the data mining side of Warframe while we had done things under the hood, um, you know, to make sure that we weren't leaking content, that we weren't ready to announce or anything. Uh, it, it, we just really hadn't, acknowledged it, I suppose. But when we literally ask the question, whose game is it anyway? If someone has a free game on their PC, is it, their, is it within their rights to you know, go through the files and start looking at things? And you know, that's, that's the, the community's vision of it. So we're not one to say, okay, stop doing that, unless it gets ugly. And this year it got ugly. We were seeing um, some things happening that, remember that Umbra I was talking about that isn't in the global build, it was in the global build somehow because somehow uh, some people had hacked it and added it in and we were able to conclude uh, where it was coming from and what the source of it was, so we had to take action. And it was in that time that the players had seen an action from us that they felt was the worst thing we had ever done. By going after data mining, we had become the bad guy because we were now trying to hide things and we, any transparency that they felt data mine offer, offered them as a community to see like, oh, DE screwed up a drop rate or whatever it may be, had vanished by us taking action. So it was really tricky because we, like, of course, we would have handled it differently now, and we just, at the time, were really scared because we didn't want things leaking because, we, again, we were wanting to surprise and delight our community again with something like the second dream, and that was the hit of this year, which was open world. So you have your sort of data mining scandal, and then all of a sudden, all, all eyes are on us because we have a, a big announcement for our community. We want to tell them we have something really exciting for you guys, and that was open world. This was a day in Warframe's history where we walked through a set of doors and showed the community what we were sort of being so secretive about. And that was this. This was the, the Plains of Eidolon announcement, which we did live uh, in front of our audience, and it was wonderful. And this was a really great moment for Warframe and the community because they saw us do something that they and we had said was impossible. And our procedural game had gone from that, thanks to the developers, to now open world. And that was um, a really special moment in the relationship because it was that surprise and delight without it even being released yet, which was quite exciting. And you know, what did we do? Well, we looked and we said, wow, people really liked that. You know, you released this um, most hyped update in Warframe's history, and we took a look at it, and we saw that it had uh, put Warframe in a position it had never reached before, and it, of course, reinforces the you know, ambition to do things like that, of course, leading into this year as well. And that was a really, really, really exciting time for us because we had a community that was overwhelmed with um, support for the idea that we were going to do that. But So, of course, you're excited and want to keep that alive, but when it when I go back to data mining just now, because um, I'm going to tell you what we did about that, because data mining is really tricky, and we're a free-to-play game, we have drop rates, so what did we do in that situation when that happened? We built a drop site repository, because uh, we saw the most, the most feedback on the, uh, the player's point of view about us going after data miners was that we're not being honest anymore, and we felt that the best way to be honest was to give them the info directly for what they were looking for. So now the community team has a new routine every update thanks to the, some tools that Dev built us that we basically run a script of every drop table in the game and output it to a web page and upload it to our web server and we update it anytime our drop tables get touched. So we, we did it because we recognized that the community wanted that information and they were getting it, but if we could provide it ourselves, you know, we would show them that we didn't go after data mining for that reason. It was a broader issue with hacking. And this website, you know, even I use it all the time because it allows people just to get information about Warframe more quickly. And that's someone that's engaged in your game and they want to know more. And, you know, it's very rare for someone to go 
which is actually quite surprising. People don't go on this website and look at it and you know, send screenshots to our inbox about how rare something is because that's not what we want to do. You know, we have rarities, of course, but we're not in it to, um, to look to trick anyone into a rarity that they may or may not have expected. So yeah, this website is an interesting thing. We only added it last year. Uh, it starts with a disclaimer about, you know, I, we, should, we don't even know if we should be doing this, but you guys want it, so here we go. And yeah, but there's some people in the room that have helped build this, so I can see them now, thank you. It's been, gr it's been great for the community relationship, which I can, of course, succinctly recap. Uh, in sort of the advice that if you become the enemy in a relationship, work on repairing it with more than words, uh, which is what that website represents as an action, because you can always say, don't worry, we're not gonna do X, Y, or Z, but if you show um, a, a plan to address the community concerns, it, it is great for the community relationship. And of course, if you're years into your game like we are at this point, um, you should definitely do things that were once impossible, so open world Warframe, for example which has been fun. So, you know, whose game is it anyway? That is the question that we are trying to answer. And the best way I can talk about that in the context of Warframe is that it's shared. We've added so much to the game based on what the community has wanted. And the community has seen that our ability to add these things is shaping Warframe into what it is today. And we, you know, you try and do it in that the community wants something, the devs are the only ones that can do it, so how do you make, how do you reconcile that? And that's where we stand in the middle uh, with the community team. And after five years, what we've really tried to view in this relationship we have is that the players really are citizens. Uh, when I was talking about dev streams, you probably have been watching perhaps or put on dev streams of your own that are a bit political in title, something like state of the game or other things that sound just a, a bit more, hmm, this is more than just a game because really you're, you're dealing with a group of people, your player base, that, that have a voice and bring their loyalty to your game and their interest and their passion and they should be represented in the same way, you know that other, other governments work. Not that we're a government, but you know, citizens, not government. Totally different words. Uh, also, so we also have um, tried to have the community team have a seat at the dev table after these five years, just making sure that, um, you know, in 2014, if we had a resource problem, maybe the next time we're introducing a new resource, the community team knows about it and we're looking and we're, we're trying not to repeat the, the issues we had done in the past, because really all it has been about is learning from our mistakes as early as 2012 when we weren't doing free to play right. And that's continued year over year. And with dev streams and you know whatever else we do in that capacity, we've found that transparency is, is painful but crucial and it's good to humanize and admit mistakes. We find sitting down on the dev stream couch or whatever setting at the, is appropriate at the time. To admit a mistake on camera is really humbling and it really shows the players that you are capable of making mistakes because one thing that happens and you often hear fan language is, you know, I have faith in this developer and when you get that sort of faith-based belief in a developer system, it's dangerous because mistakes are frequent. They are, you know, we try to make it clear it's not out of malice because that's the most dangerous part of a relationship is if they feel the decisions you've made are out of malice, which we try very regularly to reinforce they're not. But um, I uh, did that quickly, because it's the last presentation at GDC perhaps for some of you. So that is it. So I have 40 minutes of talk for you guys. So, uh, but, I shouldn't have talked over the videos. They could have just run. But if you do have any questions, now would be a good time to line up at either microphone side. And if not, that's totally cool, too. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, you were talking a lot in the beginning about how the, uh, the players ask for something, and so the devs make it so. And I was wondering, how do you, sometimes, it seems like that might not be good for the game. Like maybe the players don't know what's best or maybe there's a vocal minority that isn't really speaking for the larger player base. So I was wondering how you, you tackle those kind of concerns. 
Right, so what we try to do is take the, what the players want and make sure it's actually a scaled want. So a dev stream for us is a really good example because when we generate questions for it, we look to see what the actual most used words are. And then if we see a high frequency of the same request, we address it on air. And then we literally on air say yes or no sometimes and try, if we think it's bad for the game, we'll say no, sometimes we'll say why. And if we think it's good for the game, we sort of build a wish list of things that are good um, good, good victories to add to the game for the community. And what's surprising about that, uh, in regards to you know, players wanting things, is they typically do want realistic things. Like there are things that you can, of course, say no to. You know, like turn Warframe into first person or do something like that, which we do say no to. But generally, if a player is at the point in this community to ask for something, they they ask it and they typically they explain why they want it, which allows us to you know, address it more on the nose in the scheme of Warframe's design and future. Cool, thank you. Hello. Hi, um, have you ever had to tackle pockets of toxicity in your community, either community to each other or community to dev? Uh, yes, yeah, so toxicity in the community is, yeah, I think, you know, many games face it and we have had to deal with it time over time and we really look at you know, why it's happening. And a lot of what we've found in dealing with it, you know, basic moderation is really helpful. Of course, you can read out, um, you know, with all your tools, get someone out of it, swearing, doing this, doing that. But if there's, you know, for example, a clan that's particularly toxic, uh, that's harder to deal with because there's a lot more of the toxic individuals. And we try to make sure that we're as strict with our code as conduct as possible. So if we can clearly see, like, you violated this, you're out. There's no disputing it. But sometimes, you know, pitchforks come out, right? Mm. And toxicity can spread, especially if it becomes an us versus them scenario. And I always just try and work with that on our team as succinctly as possible in using our guidelines to work with it. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Are there any, uh, you talk a lot about engaging with the community in general. Uh, are there particular platforms or communities that you uh, find easier to use or, or better for reaching a large audience or particular audience? Just I, I, I'm a really big, so in terms of tools to engage with our community, I do think dev streams have worked out really well for that because we've just built this sort of five year familial uh, bond about what we're working on. You know, Warframe is gonna always change and grow, so why not use a tool that's not super polished in our case, but really honest about what we're doing. And that one, again, has been huge. I would say right now it's really nice to, you know, rely on Discord a bit more and the forum, our official forums are sort of like the Library of Alexandria. They house everything we've ever done and they're not the best for conversing. So you have to sort of pick your, what your goal is for a particular engagement and use something more accommodating to that, which Discord's great for conversations, of course. Awesome, thank you. Sweet. Hello. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Hi. It's I, most of the talk was about um, the early years until up until 2017. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. What's what are the challenges so far this year, and what's Warframe like in 2018 with the community? So yeah. 2018 has been actually really interesting because we haven't released actually. Tuesday of this week marked the release of new content. We hadn't added a single weapon or Warframe this whole year so far, up until Tuesday. So the year has been one of, you know, I was talking about change and nostalgia in 2016. It's heavily been on that for the first part of the year. We've gone and looked at every weapon we've released in the primary and the secondary capacity and rebalanced them. So the devs have been working hard on basically doing spring cleaning, but more winter cleaning for all the game's content rather than adding a new gun or something like that. So it's really been an exercise in revision. And it's interesting to see how the communities responded because again, they're used to consistency. Um, but the consistency this year, the weekly updates have been cleanups rather than here's your brand new XYZ. So right. thanks. And we told them that. We said, hey, you're not getting new stuff this year. You might have noticed. And they were okay with it. So hello. Hi. Um, so a company I worked at previously, like the community definitely did not have a favorable view of us. So frequently when we released even a positive announcement, uh, it would get twisted around. And they. so I was just curious, uh, what sort of like language was most twisted against you and how did you reframe your wording of it? Um, 
the language is, we are, I feel like one, it's not a tactic, it's just a thing that's happened in terms of language we've used. We talk so much on dev streams, it's really hard to pinpoint the bad things we've said because we talked so much and they can't get mad about that one like, oh, we're listening because we say it we say it in so many different ways all the time. But when it comes to the community, you know, picking a, like a, a moment to think that DE is doing a bad job of something and therefore what is coming should not be celebrated, um, it's typically in the growth of the game and the, the idea of neglect, right? So if a player sees we're adding uh, something new, they'll say that's great, but what about all the other stuff you've left behind? and they often criticize any, uh, any new things as bad because other things are being abandoned. So for example, when we added Lunaro, you could imagine that the PVE players that wanted Endgame were like, what? Like, why are you working on this and not that? And you know there's all like the false dichotomy ways to talk about it, but we just, we try and address that. Like we, we, we see the, the bubbling um, discontent and just say, well, that's actually not true because here's work that's also happening at the same time. But you, sometimes you might not have that luxury because you've become the enemy so greatly, like we had with the data mining situation, and we, you just don't give up. Like, I just, we just don't stop trying is the best way I could say that. Thank you. So I was curious, uh, how early do you guys talk about the things you're like working on? So like for our game, uh, we have a really hard balance between like, we want to talk about stuff early, and let people know we're thinking about the things they're concerned about. But if it's too early, we don't know exactly what we're going to do yet. And then we are taking things away from them or breaking our promises when we change our mind. And if it's too late, then we're just being told that we're ignoring them. Yeah. But we're not. So how do you find that balance? So the, the issue of showing something and never shipping it uh, is a very frequent one for us. I believe in, oh, I don't want to simplify this, but if you made a list of stuff we've shown on dev streams versus stuff we shipped, they'd probably be even. Um, because we just show whips all the time and we make it clear that that's what's happening. So if something's really close to being a shipped item, uh, we demo it a bit more confidently, I would say. Whereas if something's like, here's some concept art that could be a new faction in a year, we kind of say that because we know our own work pace and we know that um, no matter what, it's going to happen for us if we release something, people expect it to come out. So we are just we try very hard to emphasize the actual progress of what it is we're showing. Um, and we just want to show it. Like even if it is a year away, we typically do show it just because we want to. <laughs> so it's at your call, of course, and it is a struggle. And it's whether or not you're uh, prepared to lower expectations about things that you yourself have doubt about. Like it'll be a time on a stream where someone's really talking optimistically about something and I'm like, I don't even think I've seen work started on that. And I'll say that out loud just to make sure players see that this is messy because things aren't easy all the time. So does like the community now have like an expectation that like a lot of that stuff could not be that way and yep. they sort of accept it now? Yep, it's, okay. it's amazing the power of their own wisdom about how we operate at this point uh, because they are able to set their own expectations sort of as a, a group, which is nice. Cool, thank you. Yes, hello. Yeah, sorry, I just uh, wondering, <coughs> you, you, as you have said, you release a version later in China, right? Yes. When you're referring to the community, uh, you're referring to the global community or different country community. As I know, some players in some different countries, they have different or conflict opinions or needs to the same released version. So do you have any um, shared experience about the conflict opinions? Uh, it, it is tricky with conflicting regions. The only true region uh, restrictions are mainland China for the, that build, and the rest of the world is considered global. And it's been, uh, in that respect, there have been conflicting opinions about stuff we've released, the way the community responds to it yeah. overall, and it's always just a matter of, luckily we have an in-house team that's able to help with region-specific issues. Um, they do mainly do support, but they also can help with community stuff, and they bring that to our attention. And if it's a developer issue, we try and resolve it. Like, if we accidentally released something that looked uh, it, it not appropriate for a specific culture, we'll remedy that based on the advice of those region-specific communities. Well, OK, thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, with the uh, data mining stuff that you were talking yes. about, when you release the tool and when you release the planes of Eidolon, um, did you see a large reduction in people complaining about not being able to data mine or are there still people complaining about that? Uh, 
it still happens. So we didn't stop it. We just tried to stop it, which I think is, I think they call that the Streisand effect or something. Like if you try to stop something, it actually makes it worse. So mm -hmm. it's just what we, what had happened was Umbra had gotten into the global build and we had to address that situation. So with the Planes of Eidolon launching, we were made, we made sure that the tool could accommodate the new reward structure style. So we needed dev bandwidth to update the tool to make it read this new world. And at the time, players, you know, look to that site and they actually now build, I think one form of, former data miner builds their own tool based off of our data now just to make it more readable because it's just a HTML table and, you know, yeah. But now it actually is the source of a lot of other player tools that are just built on it, which has been really wonderful to see it being used in still a player-owned way, because they, of course, make their own websites and everything off of it, which is nice. Thank you. Hello, sir. Do you find that um, console and PC communities have different wants? And if so, how do you address priorities of that? So we have specific teams for each of the platforms, which is great, but the pipeline is always PC first, then console. And what's happened on console is, when I said region-locked content, that's one thing, because no one can have it, but there's also console-specific content, which is more, it's received fine. Like, if a console player has their version of skins, players don't mind. Um, Xbox has their version of skins, it's okay. And same with PC. And the way that they speak of the game and their needs is Typically, the most common, it comes down to UI usability and working on having an experience that is more controller friendly. And that always is, that's essentially been something we've had to work on since the day we launched on consoles. And players continue to say it's not, not quite good enough. So we still try. Thanks. Hello. Uh, so I was just, in regards to uh, players being vocal or less vocal, um, how do you? deal with, I guess, the comfort level of certain players just co commenting on their opinions of various builds, because some players might be a little more vocal and more uh, confident in talking about the content they want or their opinions on uh, updates, whereas other players might be a little bit more uh, less vocal about it for a variety of reasons, maybe just accessibility. Uh, well, there's different ways you can get broad like broad player communication or specific. Not everyone wants to write a long form forum post. Some people just want to click a vote on a poll. Some people just want to, but just by showing up, they're showing they're interested, right? If we do a dev stream on a certain topic, if the viewership is quite large, we know that there's maybe some players that aren't talking to us about that that are still interested in it. So we just gauge based on traffic and you try and use you know social media with the poll features and everything. That's a good way to get, a, you know, you never want to, commit a poll to design gospel, but it can happen. And you just have to make sure that whatever tools you've built and you own are being used frequently and be aware that players that may not want to use those tools, like we don't have an official Discord, but we're on Discord and we found that there's a lot of value there and people behave differently and more themselves there perhaps than on an official forum. So just acknowledging that the tool changes the, you know, attracts different types of players. Thank you. And I totally forgot to say, uh, turn off your phones. And um, <laughs> I just realized that. And also that you can rate the talk after. So I just realized now. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I was wondering how you guys handled international communities. Um, our game, for example, I think 60% of our player base is Chinese and Russian. Oh. Um, we're all English speakers on the dev team, primarily. Um, so we don't have a great way of communicating with them. I was wondering if you guys had a second team in those regions or how you handled smaller regions that you can't really communicate with but have very different and special feedback or? We're all in house. The community team is a seven person English speaking team at this point in time. But we also have an in-house support team, who, which is run by a gentleman sitting here that has all the languages that we support and we're able to use them as a lightning rod for really specific issues in that community. With Warframe's growth as it is today, I expect that we will start trying to have dedicated community people in our bigger regions, like Russia, but we don't have that right now, and we just try our best with the resources we have to make sure the main developer updates get translated, and ultimately, we could be doing a better job of including those communities, but we still haven't figured it out very well. So it sounds like we're in the same boat. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think that's it. Hello. Hello. Uh, could you reflect a little bit on the um, Twitch event that you had in the fall alongside Planes of Eidolon? Yes. And because it, it obviously exploded, um, 
it also must explode to your servers. Uh, yeah. So yep. um, the success of that, how you would do it differently, would you do it differently again? Right, so the Twitch event we had. So Twitch is exploding, as we all know, and there's something called Twitch Drops, which allows you to have the viewers of your game get rewarded with items in game simply for watching. So we launched a Twitch Drop campaign with the launch of our open world update to reward people watching Warframe streamers. And if you get free loot in Warframe, you're gonna show up. So we launched it at such a scale that it did bring our servers down the first day, and it did expose a vector of exploit for people to have six windows open and watch our stream. And there was a drop table that had 30 items in it, and they were getting multiples. And I wouldn't have done it differently, because it was so, ins well, I'm sure everyone on the team's like, never again, but, um, <laughs> And it, was, it actually created two levels of issues for us, obviously technical, but there was also the court of public opinion that we had paid for view bots, which simply wasn't true. People just didn't understand the draw of free Warframe loot, of course. And the streamers were having fun with it. They were gamifying it a bit. And we have refined the tool since then. Um, it is no longer exploitable. It's a lot less uh, crazy in the campaigns we do. We still use it to this day, just at a much more sane level. And I think it's worth looking into if you have a a game that on Twitch drops that could utilize the system because it is pretty cool. Hi, great talk. Um, you talked about a seat at the development table with the community team. Can you talk in a little bit more detail? Are you just collaborating with leaders or uh, individual contributors, small teams, big teams, and just how that all coordinates? So Slack has made it really easy to sort of have a virtual seat at every table. So we always try and include a community team member in the features channels. And the community team at Warframe is also, also works on live ops. So when deployments go out and when people are debating whether or not to include something in a deployment, we are involved in that. So in many ways, Slack is sort of the simple answer to that. And I think the dev team is okay with it because it's kind of annoying to be the person in the room that's like, well, the players aren't gonna like that, so don't do it. But you, it's just the nature of our relationship with our community that we need that, you need that temperature check of grind tolerance, for example, or, you know, well, there's not really a lot of PvP players right now. And it goes both ways. If we know that dev is really focused on doing something change-wise, we need to prepare the community materials. So having a seat at the table isn't just about being the fun police, it's about being the, oh, okay, this is really good information to start working on. Like, we removed a content system from the game known as Trials because there was a rapid exchange that you know, we just couldn't support it anymore. And the devs really knew that it just was not being given the love they wanted. So we, from that moment, had like to get ready to break that news to the community, so. And just a quick follow-up, did you find that it was a sort of development cultural evolution at your studio when you were getting involved this way? Um, I think the, so the, the early, early, early Warframe, it was, community, I was there on the community team and there was like eight developers, so we were all in it together from the start, so it was, yeah, so before all that, we had been doing publisher stuff, work for hire, we never had a community team, so it was there at the foundation of all this, so it wasn't added later, it's been there the whole time, which may not be the case for everyone. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think that's it. Thanks everyone, thank you so much.